As you get older, the relationship you have with your friends tends to change. Even those lifelong friends that, when you're young, you thought you would know forever, may not necessarily last through to adulthood. I tell you, if you get to the age of 35, 40, 45, and you can sit down to a table with four, five, six of your friends from when you were young, then you're doing very, very well. Enjoy it, my friends. Enjoy it indeed, because it's a rare gift indeed. Well, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. One rainy Saturday autumn night, after the jocks had thinned out somewhat, the five of us were sharing a table and a pitcher at Alberto's Pizza. Our eclectic little group included my erstwhile college classmate and sometimes good buddy, Charles Old. My cousin and roommate, Jody Weiss, who just received her master's degree in 16th century English literature. My cousin on the other side, who also lived about three streets down from us, John von Morgenstern, the 930th or so. Well, to hear him tell it, among others, one of his major hobbies included creative genealogy who loved science fiction and had sold a number of his own sci-fi stories. And, and me, Hannah Drake, still working on my PhD in astrobiology. Oh, and Tom Warner, the Santa Real County Deputy Sheriff. Tom, who lived about an hour's bicycle ride away on the outskirts of the city of Santa Real itself, was attached to the foot patrol here in Monte Vista, the little coastal town next to the University of California at Santa Real where the rest of us live. Uh, I guess it's my turn to spring for pizza, Tom offered. With perks, Tom makes more than any two of the rest of us together, so we didn't object. However, since Tom also makes, perks and all, rather less than a comfortable living, he scowled at our collective lack of protest. But being a good sport, he shrugged good-naturedly and ordered a 20-inch supreme pizza for all of us anyway. When he finally returned from the counter with the pizza, Jody asked him, Tom, all the rest of us have told a story or two about ourselves. Now it's your turn. What's the most interesting thing you've ever run into? Tom set the pizza down, sat down on the bench next to Charles, and took a wedge of pizza for himself. While we likewise helped ourselves to the pizza, he considered a while as he thoughtfully ate his own piece of pizza. Finally, swallowing a mouthful of crust, he said, Well, I don't know. I've seen some weird cases, all right. But they're all department business, and I really shouldn't talk about them. Hmm. Okay, he said finally deciding. I'll tell you one. Did you ever hear about the Eagle Girl of Valle Grande? We all looked blank. Well, except for Charles, our resident skeptic, who was busily tucking in his psychic bib in contented anticipation of a long, pleasant feed off Tom's ego. Tom went on. Oh, it happened a couple of years ago when the rains were so bad that half the county seemed to be flooding, remember? It's so weird that no one really believed it happened, well, except for those of us who were directly involved in it. So we closed the fire with death by misadventure, though we really meant death by act of God, which would have been a lot closer to the mark. Oh dear, did the great Thunderbird offer wino? Charles asked, unctuously. Well, why don't you listen for yourself and then judge, Charles or Bean? Tom replied. It started, Tom said, while Charles scowled at Tom's lack of appreciation of his scintillant wit, with an investigation of possible child abuse in one of those big, ritzy homes in Valle Grande. A psychiatrist's stepdaughter, Angel Ellis, who went to Don Alejandro Camarillo High School in Valle Grande, began coming to school more and more frightened and withdrawn every day from the first day of seventh grade on. 
A pretty, fragile little thing with long, black hair and clear, pale skin. She'd had an outstanding academic record up through the sixth grade. In spite of great shyness and a tendency to be somewhat withdrawn, but her marks suddenly dropped to straight Fs by November of her first semester in middle school. So, her teachers felt that something had to be very wrong at home, even though the girl was never bruised or otherwise physically injured. And so the school authorities called Child Protective Services, but rather timidly, since there was no physical evidence of abuse. They asked the agency to investigate the situation and find out just what really was going on. And so, CPS sent out a team, which never got inside the house. Dr. J. Manning, the girl's stepfather, a great big red-headed brood of a man. Carol Manning, Angela's mother, had died of what was apparently a side effect of medication prescribed for her by Manning about three years previous. Well, anyway... He threatened to have all the investigators run in for harassment and violation of his constitutional rights. Blah, blah, yada, yada, etc. Oh, and sue the school into the bargain. Well, since there was no evidence of physical abuse, it would have been impossible to get a warrant as it was. And since one of Dr. Manning's close friends, who also just happened to be his own personal attorney, was the head of the local chapter of the ACLU at the time. Nobody wanted to risk pushing it any further. But then Jane Bright, the school psychologist, called Child Protective Services, telling them that while Angela was obviously intermittently, well, delusional, she had told her, that is, Miss Bright, that Manning had killed her pets and had made her watch while he did it. A punishment for what he called silliness, which was the psychosis or whatever, which the school psychologist diagnosed the girl as having. God, the school psychiatrist, who frankly didn't like Manning at all, felt that Angela was under tremendous strain at home and was undergoing a breakdown and that her stepfather was punishing her for it by killing her pets. Pets? asked Jody. Hawks, and owls, oh, and an eagle. We all stared at him. She was an art stringer? John asked in delight. All his life he had loved anything and everything having to do with birds. He himself had had a pair of ravens when he was a child, and later a blue jay. And one of his life's fondest dreams was to have mews full of hawks and gear for training and flying them. Tom grinned. Yeah. Miss Bright wasn't sure whether to believe it or not. At first, she thought it might be one of the girl's delusions or hallucinations or whatever. But just in case, she reported it to CPS. Well, when CPS checked it out, they found out that the family really did keep such birds. In fact, as they learned, the girl had competed with some of those birds and had won some hefty awards for it. The family's neighbours, though, oh, weren't at all fond of the birds. <laughs> Seems the eagle had gotten loose a time or two, terrorising some small children in the area, leaving big, smelly piles of, well, faeces on the roofs and lawns, and ripping off neighbourhood livestock, like somebody's Pekingese, somebody else's budgies, right out of the cage next to an open window, <laughs> things like that, and Manning's backyard, where they kept, well, you sure wouldn't need a road mat to find it. All that bird shit, asked Charles. <laughs> right, John laughed. Raptors such as eagles are carnivores, you know. Their feces are full of ammonia, and unlike cats, they don't bury it. <sighs> Grinning, he made a face, holding his nose for emphasis. Ugh, peak bones all over the yard, I muttered. Ah, so that's what happened to Professor Braintree's poodle, Jody mused. Yeah, well, from what you've told me about that mutt, the neighbours wouldn't have given a hoot in hell about it. Shit, they'd have given the bird a good housekeeping award or something for ridding the neighbourhood of an aggravated disaster, I reminded her. 
Well, go on. What happened? John urged Tom. Well, so Child Protective Services found out that the birds no longer were in evidence, either in the air or anywhere on Manning's property or anywhere else, as far as anyone knew. So the school authorities called the SPCA, who called us. We could have called in the Environmental Protection Agency too, because, well, some of the neighbors swore on a stack of Bibles they were keeping goddamn condors in there. But that was just a bit too wild. Bringing in the feds on mere hearsay would have been suicidal, career-wise. So, uh, boss John, my boss, well, he said, screw it. But we did go in with a search warrant and an SPCA investigation team, and we found that the birds were indeed missing, and that, just coincidentally, ground for a small garden had just been prepared a couple of days before, with great big lumps in it. Over Manning's yells, shrieks of rage, curses and threats, we dug it all up again and found some rather suspicious birdie remains. Angela, who stood by silently, watching us dig up the garden, began to cry when she saw the bodies of the birds that we unearthed that night. Her stepfather yelled at her to go into the house. Oh no, Lieutenant Barry said. She may be a material witness. Dear, would you come down to the station with us and tell us how those birds got there? Barry was a kind, fatherly man, and Angela warmed to him right away. She started to say something, and was then riveted to the spot, dumb as a post, by a snake called, I'll kill you if you do, glare from Manning. She shook her head, no, without looking at any of us, tears running rivers down her cheeks, and walked slowly up to the house, as if she were going to her own execution. Oh, and son of a bitch, if it didn't turn out that the warrant hadn't been properly made out. So the cruelty to animals charge was thrown out, and we and the SPCA ended up being sued by the shrink for harassment and false arrest. And he collected too, damn him. So... What about the girl's, you know, her psychosis, anyway? Asked Charles. You still haven't said much about it. The look Tom turned on him was a study in equal measures of irritation, self-control, and amusement. Gee, I guess I didn't, did I now, Charlie? Tell you what, without too much trouble, you could have been in that backyard yourself. You have the strangest resemblance to some of those little old ladies who love to gloat over everybody else's troubles in the National Enquirer, you know? Never mind him, I said, before Charles could explode. Look, please, go on with your story. Tom looked at me and grinned. Well, for you, beautiful, I will. Okay, he continued. Ms. Bright told us that Angela had told her that she, Angela, was a bird priestess, a reincarnated Native American medicine woman who had, in her last life, been the uh, human avatar, yeah, avatar of the spirit of all eagles. She claimed she was doing bird magic to take her to the kingdom of the eagles to help destroy the bark priestess of poisons, who bore an interesting resemblance to her stepfather. Um, Charles said, grinning. Oh, boy, laughed John. Yeah, I guess she really wasn't playing with a full deck, was she? Tom grinned. Sure, yeah, she was nuts, he said, biting into another wedge of pizza. Well, I've got one for you, Charles began. Wait, son, said Tom, cutting off. I promised you a weirdy, and a weirdy you shall get. I'm not done yet, so shut up and let me finish, will you? To, um, go back to the point at which I was so rudely interrupted. He continued as Charles glared and muttered something under his breath. Apparently... Manning hated Angela because she was far, far brighter than he'd ever dreamed of being. 
Not to mention the fact that she didn't share his own view of people and life, which basically came down to screw or be screwed. Then, of course, he'd married Carol, Angela's mother, for her money, but wasn't all that happy at having to care for Carol's daughter as well. And God knew what else. Then, when Angela reached puberty, of course, things became thoroughly complicated by sex. What you might call the, um, Humbert, Humbert syndrome. No, come to think of it, old H.H. only liked the ones with no hair on their... <sighs> he cleared his throat in embarrassment, trying not to look at me or Jody. Yes, go on, Jody urged ingenuously. Damn, Tom, we're not exactly shrinking violets, you know, I snapped at him. For heaven's sake, will you go on? Jeez, man, your face is as red as Lenin on May Day, I told him, grinning. He was. His face was turning beet red out of embarrassment. Ladies, which you aren't, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves, he told Jody and me darkly. Scandalous you are. Corrupt my morals. Anyway, he continued. Some sex thing seemed to have gotten mixed up with his original dislike of his stepdaughter, and he started putting heat on her, calling her names all the time, ranging from psychiatric to dumb to just plain filthy, using any excuse at all, even making up excuses out of thin air to punish her usually by destroying or otherwise taking something she loved or wanted away from her. But the fucker was, of course, clever about it. He never hit her, never laid a hand on her. Before Carol died, he coerced her into covering up for him, and after her death, he kept Andrew at home as much as possible, only letting her out to go to school. Now Carol, his wife, Angela's mother... He beat her up all the time. Unlike Angela, you see, who by law had to go to school every day, Carol had no strong reason requiring her to go out at all, since she could have groceries trucked in, and since Manning was an MD, he could legally treat her at home if she needed that. Carol had no friends or relatives in town, or anyone else who might become concerned when she didn't appear in public and he could keep her in the house while the bruises and broken bones healed. And well, who cares about wife beating anyway? Oh, Jesus. You know, I really hope women's liberation succeeds, because I'm getting awfully freaking sick and tired of coming out to bust up the ten millionth fight between Mr. and Mrs. Hoosies. And she goes into hospital and some fancy lawyer comes down and gets the son of a bitch she's married to bailed out right when we're booking him and he never goes to jail at all. And then, the ten million first time, she dies. Nobody cares. Man. And well, that's neither here nor there, is it? Hawking sharkishly, Tom sped onto the floor by way of punctuation. One of the student busboys, sighing as he walked up to clean up the floor where Tom had spat, glared at him reproachfully. Ignoring him, Tom went right on with his tale. Oh, sorry for the digression. So, anyway, Angela began being silly, as Manning put it. That is, she began to act just like someone who's undergoing a nervous breakdown. As a psychiatrist... Manning had to have known exactly what was wrong with her. But of course he himself was the reason for it, and didn't seem at all inclined to quit being that reason any time soon, as long as he had any say in it. As you might expect under the circumstances, he dismissed her obvious breakdown in terms of something like a juvenile prank or simple childishness, and did nothing to get her into any real therapy for it. Why were none of us surprised? So, what happened? Well, January came along, and with it came the rains. And then, one stormy late afternoon in mid-January, Manning calls us in a towering rage, saying that Angela had run off, leaving a note for him that 
red nonsense, he said, saying she was going up on the mountains just north of Santa Real to call up Grandfather Eagle to give him the bark priest what he deserved. And would we run the bitch in? Well, wherever it was Angela was actually going, she hadn't taken a car. Apparently, she was going to hitchhike, or at least take the bus. She was too young to have a driver's license, and anyway, she'd never learned to drive. And because Manning had strictly supervised her activities and severely restricted her social life, she had no friends who might have given her a ride. And so, she was on foot. Unless, of course, she could hitch a ride from someone or take a bus. On top of this, just before he called, we got another call. This one from Mrs. Bridget Grady, a very concerned woman who lived just off of East Kamina Jima, the road that runs up KTSR, the TV station off Highway 150. She told us that just a little earlier that evening, she'd seen someone climbing San Miguel Peak, which was very near her home. She saw whoever it was in the glare from a lightning flash, though not very well, and it made her curious. She got out a pair of binoculars her late husband had bought back from his hitch in the Korean War, and in the next flash of lightning, she could just make out that the climber was a girl, a young girl who was dressed far too skimpily for such cold, rainy weather. But then the girl climbed down into a ravine or canyon, so our caller couldn't see her any longer. It was raining far too hard for her to go check it out herself at first hand, since she'd recently come down with the flu and still hadn't completely recovered. But she really thought the girl might be in danger, so she called us in case a rescue was needed. Well, putting two and two together, we got a crew together as fast as we could, went out to find the girl, cussing all the way. It was too wet to have much of a chance of finding her, not to mention driving up there on those goddamn slick roads this late in the day. But it wasn't quite wet or dark enough to justify postponing a search until after the rain had stopped. When we got up there, we found we'd been preceded by the girl's father, who decided to make sure we did our duty. <laughs> Fucker had borrowed a jeep from a neighbor of his, and had arrived at the foot of the peak just before we did. We couldn't stop him. He was ten or twenty feet ahead of us all the way even though the rocks were so slick from the rain that they might as well have been soaked. And so with him leading, and us chasing him as much as her, we worked our way up that deep, treacherous ravine that makes up a seam up the back of the hill to this ledge that overlooks several deep canyons running behind that range of hills. Hills. Hell. They were freaking mountains. Johnny, I remember that book Inferno by Niven and Pornell you wanted me to read. Well, I finally did get the time to read it. You were right. It was one hell of a read. Remember that place just below the first circle where Benito and Alan Carpenter looked down into hell before descending into it? It looked something like they'd have seen there. Or even like the original might have looked to Dante and Virgil. A thousand foot tall since the range behind the hills to our north is part of a tableland that gradually descends to the cold desert region east of here. A sky the colour of squid ink, where it wasn't jet black, or a weird ionised electric purple like a defective black light, or an A-bomb green from lightning. The jaws of hell, man. That's what it was. And it had fangs to go with it. Down there at the bottom of the canyon, Spires and pillars and jumbles of solid rock, up to twenty feet high, with no ground cover on them at all. Then, we saw the girl. She was sitting on a spur of rock ten feet above this narrow, rain-flooded, muddy ledge and a hundred yards to our right. She was in a sort of, well, a kind of ecstasy, an exalted trance. You couldn't tell just what the source of that exaltation was. Joy, hate, fear, fury, despair, <laughs> grief, love. None of those and all of those and something way beyond any of those were all a part of it. The rain off her face in great shining sheets and her long unbound dark hair 
so that it shone silver green under the lightning. Oh, and her face shone livid blue and green and even gold in the lightning flashes. All she was wearing was this little white, thin peasant blouse embroidered around the yoke and the hems with little blue and yellow flowers, khaki shorts, some feathers in her hair, and a turquoise and silver bracelet. That was all. Not even sandals or tennis shoes to protect her feet. There she sat, cross-legged, Indian style, her hands uplifted to the sky. Her eyes rolled back in her head so only the white showed. And she was chanting. The storm robbed most of her chant of whatever sense it had, but every once in a while she'd yell out a part of it. And the odd thing. Every time she did, a bolt of lightning cracked down from the sky, like punctuation. Um, Tom, said Charles impatiently. No shit, man, Tom snapped. That was what we noticed. But I'll give you this. Those lightning bolts came so often, anyway, and the storm was so loud that we probably missed the time she yelled and nothing happened. Anyway. Manning, who's ahead of us all the way, immediately makes for the rocky spur where the girl's sitting. He's cussing a blue streak, screaming things at her even we'd never heard before. Man, you can bet your last dollar we hear everything in our line of work. The son of a bitch is so loud we can hear him clearly above the storm, in spite of the fact that he's a hundred pounds overweight and thirty years out of condition. I guess even the rich assholes at the Monte Vallejo Heights Tennis Club finally had it with him and yanked his court privileges, or well, something. The turkey hauls himself up to where Angela is, almost one-handed, and he begins slapping her and trying to pull her down off the rocks, but finally she returns and looks straight at him. The whites of her eyes aren't showing like they did before, but She's staring at him like a horse gone mad on loco weed, wearing an expression the likes of which I've only seen on days old stiffs before the morticians get to them. A smile straight out of the pit. Hate is far, far too weak a word for what she must have felt for him. Not that I blame her. So we're finally getting up to where the two of them are, and we can see them both very clearly. Her eyes look like burning sulfur in the lightning flashes. He finally begins to get through, even to him. For just a second or two, he draws back. And now the bastard recovers himself. Rearing back, he howls, Slut, you fucking little whore, at her, and aims a roundhouse punch at her. It never connects. Just as he tenses to make his punch, her mouth opens in this sunken in gape, as she throws her head back, eyes closed, and flings up her hands and moans. <laughs> I could feel the hair rising on the back of my neck as he did this imitation of her cry. Everyone at the table flinched too, even Charles, who wasn't quite able to cover up his reaction, even with his best effort to do so. His punch never connects, Tom went on. Sheet lightning suddenly covers the sky high up. By its light, for just an instant, we see these three black winged shapes diving straight down at the girl and her old man. We are paralyzed by the sight of them, unable to move when, moments later, they strike. Or rather, the middle one does, sinking what I swear to Jesus Christ and all the saints are four-inch talons full length into Manning's back. Screaming, Manning pitches off the rock he's been standing on, down onto the ledge where we are, and then, thanks to the momentum of the attack, over the ledge and down onto the rocks below. The bird that attacked him shoots back up into the sky, wailing like a banshee, joining its two huge companions, which in the meantime were turning circles in the sky above the girl. And then, well, the three birds vanished. That is, he said, looking over at Charles. 
there was another blast of sheet lightning. Then a regular bolt of the stuff, and we were so dazzled by the sky pyrotechnics that we could barely see anything as it was. Somewhere in there, the birds disappeared. Maybe why we were still rubbing the fireballs out of our eyes. Also, right about then, the girl pitched off the rock where she'd been sitting. Unconscious and exhausted, well, we had to scramble to catch her. We were too busy watching for anything else. Either way, we didn't see the birds go. Well, we got the girl down off the rock safely and took her to St. Mary's Hospital back down in Santa Real, where she was treated for exposure and shock. By the way, Angela subsequently recovered completely and is now on the Dean's List at a very good girls' school back east. Anyway, as soon as we could, we went back for Manning. After the rain stopped and we could get back up there and reach him. By that time, of course, the dude was very dead. He'd fallen hundreds of feet onto the rocks and there was no way he could have survived. His skull was flattened due to impact against the rocks and his brains were splattered all over creation. It took us a week to decide just how to write it all up so we wouldn't all get hauled away to a psychiatric hospital once our superiors had reviewed it. We finally closed the case as death due to misadventure. Like I said, and, well, that was that. But those birds, what about them? John reminded him. Oh yeah, the birds. Reaching into his pants pocket, Tom said, I don't know. What would you say wore feathers like these? I've been keeping these as a good luck charm, he explained, a little sheepishly also. He went on, glaring at Charles. Sometimes I sort of take him out and look at them, to remind myself that I don't know everything, and I never will. Here. So saying, he pulled an envelope out of his pocket and took out several feathers, heavy and long, an oily greenish black in color, and some shorter golden tan, all rubber banded together. Dark, gluey soil, almost tarry in color and consistency, was still embedded in them. Condors, breathed John, inspecting them. That's, yes, they are. Those are the tail feathers of a harpy eagle. You, you say you found these at the site? Um, no, not exactly, said Tom. He now pulled a second rubber-banded bundle of feathers out of the envelope. Now these did come from the site. Take a look. Compare these to that bunch of feathers, people. We did, passing them among ourselves. They were identical, point for point, right down to the bits of tarry, gluey dirt caught in them. I can't tell any difference between them. And this dirt? said John. That's right, said Tom. Even the soil types of that muck stuck in the feathers is identical. But the thing is, in neither case is it soil from the area where Manning died. You see, those feathers in that second bunch drifted down into a branch of bush next to the rock where the girl had perched, and I took them out of that bush and ran them through a forensic analysis myself. Don't tell me, snorted Charles. The first bundles from the La Brea Tar Pits? <laughs> Close, Charlie. But you don't win no cigar. Tom wore a grin like a skull. His eyes were invisible behind the Polaroid glare of those lenses of his glasses, which had been turned into molten silver by the overheads. Hmm. They were from some of the bird carcasses we found in that garden we dug up at the shrink's place in Valle Grande.
So what did you think of that one? Very weird, wonderful tale from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. A weird one indeed. Well, I don't know at all what to make of that one. So your thoughts, feelings and comments are very much welcome in the comments section below the video. And I will, as always, do my best to uh, reply to any comments left. But please bear in mind, I am in the middle of my move from Istanbul to Holland. And it's taken up a lot of my time, as you can imagine. But, well, still keeping things going here on the channel. Hope you appreciate it, because I'm still having fun. Well, that is enough for tonight. But I will, of course, be back again on Wednesday. Doesn't matter what's happening in my life. I will deliver a video for you, regardless. Anyway, for one night, that's enough. So, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?